Thank you. Wow, what a great honor. Um, you know, I was sitting here listening to the music. Was that not amazing? Come on, that was amazing, right? We have people listening online. We have people watching online. We have you guys here, but then just the environment in the room and the music and the worship and everything that Pastor David and his team uh, are doing for our students is an amazing thing. And we're in an amazing place where we get to worship God in every fiber of what we do here at Liberty University. And I just wanna share a little bit about our School of Business with you. Our faculty are right over here. Give them a hand. Pretty amazing people. Uh, they come every day and serve our students both online and residentially with everything that they have. And they leave it all on the field of play and the field of battle, if you will. Uh, in the School of Business, uh, the verse that they focus on is Luke 10, 27. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. And if we approach every area of life and everyone we encounter with that, then we are going to create value for them. And in our school of business, that's what it's all about. You go out to industry, whatever that is, and begin to create value and serve people where they are. So I just want to introduce now our, our new dean uh, who truly believes in serving God where he is. It's an honor that we're able to bring him here to Liberty. We look forward to seeing what he's able to do with the School of Business and taking it to a whole new level and to new heights. We have a phenomenal school already. Um, I think most of you would know him as a congressman of the 7th District here in the state of Virginia. Uh, he's worked with the World Bank. He gets economics, which I love. Um, and <laughs> good job, economics. Uh, he also uh, got his business administration degree from Hope College. He holds a Master's of Divinity from Princeton, a Master's, excuse me, in Theological Seminary, and then uh, a PhD in Economics from American University. Most importantly, he has a wife, Laura, daughter, Sophia, and son, Jonathan. So we're so, great to have, so grateful to have him here. So now let's welcome Dr. Dave Bratt. Good morning, Liberty. How are we doing? <clears throat> this, is, this is great. I got the Dean of Engineering in front of me. <clears throat> He's bringing out the engineering students. I'm the business school. We're bringing out our business students. If you're in business, raise your hand. Let me see what we got. Engineering. Hey, thank you. And uh, another round of applause to all the folks over here who makes this uh, event possible for all of us, <laughs> Tiffany and company. And you got the new Dean of Engineering sitting here in the front row, come up and say hi to him. So they asked me to give a TED Talk, and I'm used to a Congress talk, so I had to Google that TED Talk thing, see what that's all about. And uh, first of all, uh, the business, the building we got coming uh, before Dean Hicks, he is still good. Uh, we have a phenomenal program, a phenomenal building uh, due to all the folks, and uh, he says Dave's going to come in here and change it all and bring it to new heights. Uh, he used to be the Dean of Business. So let's give him applause for setting it already on heights and getting it going. All right, so they asked me to do a TED Talk, and then I gave one title, and I think it was a little too hot for my Congress days, so then I gave another one, it was a little cold, it was a little boring, so hopefully I got it right. I'm going to talk on faith and culture and the secular world and all that, and try to give some insight uh, to everyone here what's going on uh, in the broader world. I just came from a, a tough place up in Congress. And uh, this is just like a slice of heaven coming here, right? I, my joke here is I come here and everybody tells the truth all day, right? <laughs> it's, it's just a strange new land for me. And so help me as I get adjusted and pray for me and, and all that. So I went out and Googled how I was supposed to start off a TED Talk. They said, follow the TED Talk format. And I'm going, well, I don't know what that is. So I Googled some excellent speaker. You know, he said, how do you start up a talk? He said, well, first of all, you got to build a connection with everybody. He said, so go to LinkedIn and look up all the people you're going to talk to. So I did that. I know everything about all of you already. <laughs> and we have a lot in common, right? I know uh, someone you know. I know one of your dearest best friends. I know uh, a couple of your brothers. And I know that uh, we're already friends, right? Because this, I think, is a uh, Bible-loving, God-loving place. Is that true? How many of you love Jesus? All right. So how do I know all this about you already? Well, raise your hand if you love Jesus. How many of you consider Jesus your brother? So right off the bat, I know your brother. 
right? I know someone you know. So we have mutual acquaintances. And then secondly, if you're a Christian on a good day, we're all brothers and sisters. Look to your left and right. Everybody in here is your brother and sister? We all good with that one? So I'm related to you, and I'm your brother. That's a pretty tight-knit family, right? And on top of that, I'm already your friend. How many of you have heard of Brother Aristotle? All right, take Philosophy 101 if you haven't. All right, Aristotle had a pretty good definition of friendship. He said, friends share similar ends or goals. And what is the goal of liberty? To produce champions for Christ, right? Or as Provost Hicks said, to I think we all share the same ultimate goal, right? Not just kind of like being in business together, whatever. We share the same ultimate goal, right? To love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. But, so I already know you. So then after I Googled that, then I Googled, well, I'm supposed to talk on the relationship between faith and the secular world and better look up something in the Bible. So luckily, I think God providentially intervened a little bit, and I heard a sermon over the weekend on Acts 17. Who knows Acts 17? Paul goes to the Agora area. <laughs> I'm not going to pronounce the second one. I'll just say the Agora, because that's where I'm going to pay attention. So he walks in there, and the Agora is in, in Greece, right, in Athens, and it's right underneath the Acropolis, right, all the huge beautiful towers and whatever. And Athens at the time was the center, the cultural center of the world still, right? Rome had taken over, but Athens was still the cultural center of the world. And Paul goes straight in, right? So it's the business center, it's the arts center, the law courts are right there, the libraries are right there. It's the center of the world. And Paul goes right in there and he says, I notice you all have an altar over here to the unknown God. He says, so, and he, he, he got he, got a little hot at him. He said, so I see you have no clue who you're worshiping, right? In other words, right? He said, so I'm here to proclaim who that unknown God is, right? And so that's our faith going right into the center of culture. And then he cooled it down a little bit. And he said, so therefore, let us reason together. Pretty good, right? And so I think I want to kick off and I'm going to cover all the Western Civ in 30 minutes. You ready? Buckle up for this thing, right? I'll try to cover the whole shoot match. How much? They got a timer for me, so you know you're safe. I'm not going to go too much over. So first of all, let me give you just a whirlwind of my life. I'm here representing the business school, and so hopefully in this talk I'll weave in a, a few key things uh, that I want you to share with all the students, not just here, but throughout the whole country, throughout the whole world, right? Because we all are on the same page. And so building your career right, shouldn't just start at, you know, 18 or 22 or wherever you're at in life, right? It should start way early. How many folks here have had the uh, Bible courses, right? Raise your hands high. I can't see all well. Good, good. How many have had the theology course? How many of you have had the worldview course, right? So all of that lays the foundation, and I'm going to talk about foundations all day today. All of that lays the foundations for God's purpose in your life, for your vocation, for your career, but you're the only one that can hear inside, right? When you read the Word, you're the only one that knows uh, exactly how all of the pieces fit together for you. And so we have a lot of resources at Liberty for everyone here in residence, everyone listening out there on the internet. Hello, I'm Dave. Nice to see you all. Thanks for being with us. And we have a lot to share. We have the Career Center. Do you all know the, who's here from the Career Center? Sarah, Mark, Kate, right? They're back there. Go see them. Go get them and give them a round of applause because they're working for you. And the provost was right. The business school isn't just for business students, right? We're here to serve the university and to serve the world, right? So, and the Career Center has the same exact mission. And then we have the Entrepreneurship Center. You're going to hear some words on that coming up in a little bit. And then we want you to—the uh, entrepreneurship piece is important because it really has to do with you all are here to add value, right? It, it's not just about business and making money. Adding value is about building up the kingdom of God, right? So each of you is a special child of God with certain talents, and God wants you to fully use those. 
And so that's what we're all here doing together, right? And so the business school wants to be a part of it, the career center, the entrepreneurship center. You'll learn more and more and more. We're all here to help you and our students uh, fully every day. So let me just give a quick whirlwind, whirlwind tour of, of my life. And it's always easier to see God's work looking in the rearview mirror, right? So the Congress piece, I have no clue what just happened yet, right? But we'll meditate on all that. But I was born in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, dad was a doctor. Mom was a nurse. Uh, both great Christian parents uh, raised me in the faith. I had two younger brothers. Uh, moved us, if you're from Michigan, you go like that, in the middle of the mittens, right? There's Elma, tiny little town, 10,000 people. Uh, then my dad uh, was in private practice. He couldn't say no to anybody. He did, right? He worked out. He's a physician, but a Christian physician. And so we, he moved us to Minneapolis where he could get a more defined job. All right, we got some Minnesota fans. All right, very good, very good. Don't get me going. I'll, I'm gonna, politician in me likes to find out who I'm talking to, but we'll bypass that. So moved to high school. Thanks, Dad, for that one. Right, all new friends in the ninth grade. Anyone had to go through that? Any preacher's kids? Military kids? So you know the drill, right? Moved off, uh, went through high school, loved it, had fun. Uh, went back to uh, Holland, Michigan, on the far west side of the state, right? a bunch of Dutch people, right? And so uh, my dad went to Hope College. I went there. It's Dutch Reformed, uh, close to Presbyterian, were the frozen chosen. So if you saw me uh, not moving on the side over there, my legs really, uh, you know, I got faith, but I don't know how to move, so it's, don't hold it against me. And so uh, majored in business, uh, started minoring in religion. I had a few great professors that made a huge impact on me, world religions prof, philosophy prof, uh, my pastor there. Huge impact on my life, but I majored in business, so I went off into business. Worked for Arthur Anderson, top of a shiny building in Detroit, and a bunch of money, and they sent me to Chicago, and you could fly all over and all that, right? So loved it. Uh, but if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of an extrovert, right? I like talking. So I was at the coffee and the water cooler talking, and I was supposed to be coding in COBOL in the back room on healthcare distribution systems or something like that. Can you all hear me, by the way? And so that was great. Uh, great high-energy friends, people, highly talented, a lot of athletes uh, that they recruited. So it's a fun place to work, but I just, it wasn't me. And I started feeling something coming over me. And somehow there's a fog over this, right? But I applied and got into and then went off to Princeton Theological Seminary. And so I, I could feel God was at work, right? And a lot of people these days say, I heard God talk to me. I didn't hear a voice, right? I don't, I'm not sure if that's biblical, right? That you can actually, right? But I heard God talking through the Bible, through God's Word. I could feel and I, my life's talents and the people who inspired me. And so I went off to seminary, and I was going to be a professor of systematic theology. And a lot of people say, well, Dave, did you just give up on seminary, right? And then when you go into economics and then politics, they think you lost your soul, right? So I said, no, <laughs> right? I'm, I believe in the sovereignty of God, right? God moves you all over the place uh, for different reasons. And uh, so I went to seminary, and I was going to teach, you know, systematic to Calvin and all that stuff. But then later on in life, I see I, I never lost that systematic part. Right at a university, that's what we try to do, is cobble together all the disciplines. And that's what I want to talk uh, together a little bit about today in a whirlwind fashion. And so uh, from there, I went on a political semester from seminary down to Wesley Seminary in D.C., met a guy who wrote a book on economics and ethics. That's a joke in the same book, right? So you guys are not cynical enough, right? Did you catch that? Economics and ethics in the same book. <coughs> Got it? And so he, this was great, and then all this, I had mentors there at that school, and they said, hey, if you really are serious about this, economics and ethics fitting together, you better go and do your PhD in economics at American, which is the sister school to Wesley Seminary. So I went and did a PhD there and worked at the World Bank and worked for the Army a little bit, and then met my wife, and got a job in Ashland and taught at Randolph-Macon, and what did I teach there? Economics and ethics. And so that led me into applying economics and ethics, right, because eventually you want to apply this stuff in the real world. So I worked for seven years for the head of Senate Finance in Virginia, Walter Stosh, accountant, Baptist, right? So I try to follow people with some economics and ethics, right? So accountant, Baptists are hard to come by. If you know some, tell me about them. 
we want to bring him here. Uh, and that was a great experience. And then he said, well, get ready to run for my office if you want to do that. And I, so I thought about that and prayed about it. And I, yep. And then there's this thing called a political machine. And the political machine said, no, you can't do that. And I said, what do you mean you can't do it? Is this a democracy? And so I said, okay, whatever. So I waited a couple years. Another slot came open, delegate slot, a little lower slot. I didn't care. I just wanted to do public policy. Right? I just wanted to serve the people in the state level or wherever. And this machine comes up to me again and says, uh, you can't run for that slot either. So I'm getting sick of this machine thing, whatever it is, right? I said, well, who's ahead of this machine? They said, well, over there. And I said, well, how can I get rid of this machine? They said, well, if you run for this office, that'll take care of it. So I ran for U.S. Congress and won somehow. That was a miracle, let me tell you, right? So that, there's no doubt about that one. Uh, I ran against someone with five million bucks. I had 150,000. That never happened before. And the next person was going to be Speaker of the House, right? I'm glad I did not know that when I started to think about it, right? So that was a big deal. Uh, stayed in Congress, and now it first couple years was easy. Went around, did town halls, uh, and now it's just getting rough. The press, it's just a war, and I want to. That's what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. Is this cultural war? Uh, that's going on out there. It's, it's a spiritual war. It's at every level of our society. It affects education. It affects the church. It affects everything. Uh, and so, uh, and, and I'll be back. I'm going to, once we get in the new uh, business school, right, I'll have, you know, Dean's pizza parties or whatever. So I, I wanted to do a Q&A here today, but uh, we won't fit it in. But I'm, I'll, I'll be around probably more than you want me. So that's enough on me. Except for the most important part. Uh, I lost my last election, and I prayed for the win. And I'm so glad God overruled me. Right? And so I ended up in a place where I totally feel God at work uh, in this place, at liberty in my life, and the connections we're going to build together uh, in business, the faith community, the church, the world. And we have to change the culture, right? And if we don't turn that around... Uh, for God, uh, we're in trouble. And so, let me give you a little bit on that, right? I, got, I wrote a book uh, a few years back, probably five years back, called The American Underdog, for obvious reasons, right? And so, if you have a hard time sleeping at night, I highly recommend that book. Right? So, go pick up that book. But part of the reason I referenced the book is because I laid out the foundations that made this country great. And it was pre-coming to liberty, right? So I wasn't making this up for a liberty talk, right? And guess what the first and foremost important institution and foundation that made this country great? And there's no question about it. And it is the Judeo-Christian tradition, period, right? And so that's foundation one. And then upon that, uh, the law uh, was built on that foundation eventually in, in history, and then finally, we got free markets and a pro-business philosophy and attitude, and that fed the world. And so let me just cover these real quick, right? The Judeo-Christian tradition I'm not going to cover because I've seen you already had Bible courses and theology and, and everything, right? Uh, but uh, one thing you learn there is that God is sovereign over every sphere of life. So in this room, are we in agreement? Is God sovereign over education here? Is God sovereign over our politics? Is God sovereign over the law? Yes, right? Now, God's sovereign over it, uh, but if the people decide to duck and run and walk in the wilderness for 40 years, is God going to let you? And is our culture doing that a little bit right now? Maybe a lot. We'll see about that, right? And so the Judeo-Christian tradition is the found. It, it's through the Greeks right, and then through Rome, and then through the Reformation and the Renaissance, and every great theologian had to bounce seriously, right, against the philosophy of their time, the music of the time, the arts of the time. There was, there's no exception until this century. So you're all growing up in a strange century where the foundation and the wheels are just flying off the machine, right? And so let's just take a quick survey. The law, uh, the law in the Bible obviously comes from Moses, right? Good. Leviticus, right? Deuteronomy, Moses, right? The law and the prophets. And then you work your way through history, and you get some Roman law, and they did okay. And then you get the Magna Carta in England, right? In the ten hundreds or so. Uh, the first break with the king, right? A little check on the Senate 
pre glimmerings of the Senate and the House here. Uh, and then you go through the Enlightenment, you know, 1500, 1700, and you get our founders and Locke and Hobbes and all these political theorists, Jefferson, Madison. Uh, who's heard of James Madison? Very good, that's good. It's from around here, I hear. Jefferson, anybody Jefferson? Anybody know, here's your trivia bowl question, you can holler out for this one. Where did uh, Madison go to school? <coughs> Very good. Princeton Seminary, right? It's a seminary back then. Uh, and so he's trained in, and he's the primary hand in what famous document? Constitution of the United States, right? So he, that is our law. Now we're changing it like crazy in ways I don't particularly like. Uh, but he is the primary author of the Constitution. And so if you're at Princeton Seminary studying under those great old T. Witherspoon and whoever they all are, right, all the great theologians they had there, uh, how long does it take for human nature to do a belly flop in the Hebrew Scripture? How many chapters? Two, two or three? Right? So you just start reading in human nature and the fall kick in immediately. And that's his education and that's his worldview. Here at Liberty, do you have a worldview? Yes, and you articulate it clearly, right? It's a distinctive thing. That's what I'm eventually getting to, right? How distinctive liberty is in the world. And so Madison knew all this. He writes a constitution. And if you know that human nature is not just fallen, but very fallen, how would you construct a government? Would you put all the power in the hands of one person? Or would you separate it as much as possible? A division of powers, right? So that's what he did, right? So vertically, you got the executive, and then you got the legislative and the judicial. And so there's a separation of powers, right? And it's funny, in this is, all comes kind of out of the Enlightenment as well, right? So the Enlightenment thought, and I'll get to economics in a minute, uh, but keep it small so all the power doesn't uh, flow up to Rome. And in terms of the law right now, where is all the power in this world located? Seriously. Where are all the cranes building skyscrapers? In what city? Washington, D.C., right? It's the new Rome. And so we have not done a good job of separating power uh, like Madison put in place. And you can see the results of that, right? Everybody is going to D.C. to get their hands on billions and billions of dollars. Everybody. That's the new business model. And that's not the way to get rich or set up a successful society. And so that's the law in a quick nutshell, and the power of the Judeo-Christian tradition set us up for greatness, right? This, this country and our politics has been the envy of the world. It's not perfect, but it has been the envy of the world. We set up human rights language, right? We set up rights language and put it in law. And now everybody wants the rights, but no moral responsibility to go with it. Right? And so now let's pivot to economics, the third pillar, right? The Judeo-Christian tradition, the rule of law, Moses into Madison and our documents, and then uh, free market economics. And part of the reason I want to offer this to you is because I want to offer you some encouragement as Christians. Sometimes you feel beaten down, right? The media beats you down as Christians every day, right? And let me give you a little positive facts that'll make you feel good about what the Judeo-Christian tradition has done for the world. So 200, up to 200 years ago, all of human history made how many dollars a year per person? All of human history up to about 1750 made a thousand bucks a year. Tops, right? A thousand dollars a year per capita. What's that get you? Subsistence, right? Food, and that's about it. Right? And then at 1700, boom, massive economic growth takes place in really only Judeo-Christian lands. That's interesting. If you say that out there in a journal, you will get blasted. Believe me, I've gotten blasted so many times you don't know. Right? But go, go take a look. There's, there's a bunch of scholars out there, uh, mainstream, secular, who also, unfortunately, that's what the data shows. And so why did that happen? Well, the Judeo-Christian tradition laid down the rule of law. When you have rule of law, you get stable governments, and that's hugely helpful, right? What do you got going on in South America right now? Instability all over the place, right? And how's their economic growth going, right? Does anybody want to invest their money in a country that's getting ready to blow up next year? No, right? And so also at 1750, there's a one economist I follow, and she argues that the major change, right, usually economic growth is caused by capital accumulation, 
right, and trade and technology and education, et cetera, patents, property rights, R&D, those are all, t but she's got a fascinating, fa fascinating thesis. She says economic growth really kicked in when the moral language changed for the first time in history, about 1700, where we started saying the businessman and the businesswoman is morally good. Think about that one for a minute, right? So if you go back, right, to your Plato's and your Aristotle's and even Augustine, right? You can go to the Eastern tradition, Confucius and Buddha, et cetera. Uh, the Eastern tradition sometimes wanted to opt out of history, right? Let's just reach enlightenment by opting out of history altogether. And not our tradition. We said, no, God made history for a reason, right? And so the language really changes. Our early tradition wasn't, didn't have favorable language toward business, et cetera. And then the Protestant Reformation, right, Luther and Calvin really helped to flip that, right? And they both really kind of inverted things and said, no, it doesn't matter if you're a bricklayer or an IT person or an IS person or a scientist or whatever. Whatever you do, no matter what you do, uh, your vocation is service to God. How many people in this room believe that? What you do all day is service to God. And what do you do with most every waking hour of your life? Work, right? Monday to Friday, sometimes Saturdays, hopefully not too much on Sundays, <laughs> right? But that's what you do all day. And so thank goodness this changed. And now uh, when I started teaching economics about 25 years ago, the Chinese and the Indians were still making only about $1,000 a year per capita. Right? And just to get to the crux of my little lesson here on freedom. And uh, what's the name of this school again? Liberty. Right? So I like economic freedom. I like political freedom. Uh, liberty, what a name. And so China and India, up to 25 years ago, are still making only $1,000 a year per capita. And then what did they both do? In the last 10 years, they're just on, China's growing at 10, 11% per year. It's unheard of growth. And now instead of $1,000 a year, they're at about 10 or 11 or $12,000 a year per person. What does that buy you, by the way, versus 1,000? They're starting to get electricity, a little health care, a little nutrition, some meat, vegetables, right, housing. Uh, is that morally good? Does God want that? How did that happen? Right? In this country, ironically, the answer is we need more government solutions and we need more bureaucracy and whatever. Uh, how did China and India go to massive explosion in economic growth? China was a communist regime economically. They still are politically. But what did they do ec economically? They went toward free markets. They freed up. And right, India was a very traditional society. Uh, and they opened up. Right? So you just fed the Judeo-Christian tradition, laid the, out the formulas and the foundation and the cookbook for the world to follow. And so if you want to talk about an improvement in human welfare, what I just said right there in two minutes, that is the biggest, human, biggest increase in human welfare in all of human history by far. Nothing touches it. Two and a half billion children of God are not now starving, they're getting food. And a little nutrition, right? And a little food, and a little health care. Two and a half billion people. At, would they have gotten that without the Judeo-Christian tradition which preceded them, laying the groundwork for the rule of law and for free markets and for a positive business mentality? Would the world have that gift? No. And that's what you're laying here, right? That you're preparing that groundwork for the next generations here at Liberty, right? And I could go on and on and on. There's another good book, if you want to take a, uh, take a look at, uh, called The Soul of the American University uh, by Robert Merton. And he shows what's happened to the soul of the American University, and it's not going too good. And let me just summarize that, uh, take an MBA program right across the country, if you go to an MBA or business program, or just a straight up philosophy program. If you go next door to UVA and look at the business ethics book, uh, Pat Werhain writes a book. Business ethics, has got 45, 50 pages on ethical schools of thought, right? And then 450 pages come after it, case studies where you gotta apply all that to the ethics. So guess what the three schools of ethics are that you get at UVA 
And the reason I bring this up is because this is a, the same across the country. You'll get this in every single, basically, philosophy book and every MBA book across the country. Right? So there's three schools of philosophy. And I'm not knocking these, right? They're good to study. Intellectually, they're, they're stimulating. Immanuel Kant, Kantian ethics. Anybody heard of Kant? K-N-T, German. Great, great philosopher, right? Uh, you got the utilitarians, Bentham and Mill, right? Greatest good for the greatest number and all that kind of thing. And then you've got virtue theory. And that's kind of Aquinas, the Catholic tradition, the virtues, et cetera. There's a lot of people that write on that in, in, the, in the business world. Uh, what's the problem with this? So I go around all the time in Congress, and I give rotary talks and talk to students and whatever. And so let me check with you to see how you are on this, and I'll show you what the problem is. Right? So that's all they study. That's all the ethics they study. And then they say, we teach our students business ethics. And these, this is what we taught them in terms of ethics. And so raise your hand if you're a Kantian. Yeah. There's not many Kantians. All right, raise your hand here if you're a utilitarian. This, and this is what I get everywhere I go. Uh, raise your hand if you follow virtue ethics. No. Raise your hand if you're a Christian, Jewish, Confucius, Buddhist, Hindu. You see a little problem we have in the modern world? Right? So all the ethics we're teaching at every university across the world, no one lives them out. What system of ethics do people live out in the United States in particular? The Christian tradition, right? The Judeo-Christian tradition. And so what's going wrong, right? And so one of the things you ought to be most proud of uh, being at Liberty, this is just a note of huge distinction, is we actually know what is good. Those other schools of philosophy, the students come out graduating, right? Fancy degree or whatever, from wherever. And they have not been taught what a good life is. And at Liberty, you are, right? From your freshman year on, you get a good sense of what a good life is. And so that is just a huge point of distinction. And in the business school, we really want to emphasize that, right? If you, there's a new history of Harvard just came out, Harvard Business School. They run the world, by the way. Right? Harvard Business School, McKinsey Corporation, the consultants and whatever. And Harvard Business School has struggled. It used to, in the 50s and 60s, it was all about management. And then in the 80s, it went to Wall Street and making money, financial stuff. And now everybody in, is going toward engineering, IT, technology, big data. Right? But for the full 100 years at Harvard Business School, they have not been able to define what a good life is. And they know it. And they're self-critical. Anytime someone gets arrested, right, Boski, back with a financial crisis, whatever, goes to jail, and someone gives him $30 million for an ethics program, right? Every time they get in trouble, Harvard Business School, they get another $30 million for business, for ethics stuff, right? Versus what do we have here at Liberty? Right from the start, you've got Bible, theology, worldview. Do you learn what a good life is in those courses? And then the trick is applying that to whatever discipline you go into. How many people here are not business school, right? And so it doesn't matter if you're business school or not. How many people here, how many students, how many have your resume ready to go? How many of you don't have your resume ready to go? How many are lying? All right, it's a pretty honest response, right? That's hugely important. How many of you here have heard of this thing called handshake in the career center here? Career Center, you better be applauding for that call out. Is that good? Make sure you sign up for Handshake. Why should you sign up for that? They've got every Fortune 500 business out there wants to find out who you are to hire you. And then you can also use Handshake to find out who those businesses are, right? And then we've got Alex, he's about ready to come up in a minute, uh, and he's gonna talk about the entrepreneurship program. And that doesn't, he wants to get not just business majors, but every major in this university thinking like an entrepreneur. And why is that? So you're passionate about whatever you're gonna do. How many people know what you're gonna do? Students, you know, you know where you're heading? How many are still wandering a little bit? Good, and good for you. I was wandering, right? I didn't, I didn't get a real job till right now. <laughs> right? So you got time. You're in no hurry, right? But get in there. Those people, why are they here? Why are they in career services? 
to help. They're only here to help you, right? In the entrepreneurship program and the handshake program, what, let me do more than that. <laughs> They're going to owe me in career services. All right, everybody get out your notes. For, this is the one thing I want you to write down. We're having the 2019 Career Fair on March 26, 1 to 4, Career Fair. And then you're all going, oh, what do I got to go to Career Fair, right? And then secondly, Experience Google, March 28th, 5.30 to 7 in the Career Center as well. And the Career Fair, raise your hand if you're non-business. How many of you have been to a Career Fair? A couple, right? So the hands went down. And the first time you go, you're going to be, well, what am I doing here, right? But what you can do, go start getting business cards and start entering them in your contacts, right? Back when I was in college, I did not know this. I did not have anybody tell me this. I knew a bunch of people who probably could have got me a job, right? Met a ton of people. I didn't take their name, their email, their cell phone number. Make friends with them, right? Business is about making friendships and relationships, uh, and those people will want to help you out. Senior people in business love getting in front of students, right? I got one minute and 17, 16, 15. Okay, good. I made it through. Was that coherent? Did you get what I'm trying to do? All right, in a nutshell, and then, <laughs> in a nutshell, we live in a very fallen world. Our foundations are under attack, right? The left, and I don't mean Democrats, right? I mean, there's, there's this thing called the left in academic circles. They have been deconstructing the world as you know it and all the foundations that made this country great for about 50 years, since the 1960s. They've been deconstructing the Judeo-Christian tradition. Then they deconstructed natural law, right? Catholic, Aquinas, that was kind of by reason alone, somewhat. They've deconstructed that. They got to the point of deconstructing even rationality is up for debate, whether reason exists. You with me on that? If you're interested in that kind of stuff, go read Alistair McIntyre, Brief History of Ethics. Go to the Divinity School, they know all that stuff. Right? So they've deconstructed the Judeo-Christian tradition. They've deconstructed the rule of law to the point now that how are we treating our police officers when you turn on the news in the big cities? It's sad. These are the people who put their lives on the line for us, right? And they're being mocked and ridiculed. And the left has deconstructed free market economics and business to the extent that now young people growing up think business is bad and not worthwhile, and why would you do that? What a depressing vision, right? The idea that what you're going to do all your waking day is morally corrupt. In contrast to that shines Jesus and God's vision and the foundations which have been built up for a fallen world Right? Remember your Madison, Adam Smith, same thing in economics. He said, keep it small. Right? You don't want a lot of, you don't want big monopolies. You want a lot of small firms duking it out. Same as Madison, same exact enlightenment logic. Keep it small, keep competition, keep the economy healthy. The left is deconstructing all of that. And liberty just shines like the city on a hill. Right? It just shines in this world. So you do not know how blessed you are. You probably do. I don't need to say that to you. Right? I just feel especially blessed to be here because for me, it's such a contrast. So hopefully you know how blessed you are. I look forward to getting to really know everyone here. We'll set up Dean's, you know, hours on this topic and that topic and everything uh, going. But uh, I just wanted to offer you some words of encouragement and to let you know I've been here just for a few weeks and I've just been treated with open arms, with warmth. And for me, it's just been a reaffirmation of my Christian faith, of my life, of my heart. Paul went out to the Agora to speak from the heart, and he said, I'm distressed. I was distressed before I got to liberty, and now I'm not. So God bless you all, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs>